I'm a Brazilian stuck in Texas. Uh, so my 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 talk about the legacies of Amazing Grace uh, navigates a number of resonances, and, and I'm grateful for for, for Dr. Kaimarsh, for Dr. Reggie, for the, the perspectives they've given us today, uh, because they really paint this picture. When I think about it, as I pull on the thread of Amazing Grace within Brazilian hymnody, which is you know what I do, um, it's it's a it's a legacy that resonates with the slave trade within the context of, of the, the British Empire. The three first hymnals published in Brazil uh, of Protestant hymnody were published by two by British missionaries, or missionaries from Great Britain, and one by a Polish Jew by way of London. So there's a theme there, right, the missionary presence that comes um, um, through the channels of, of that trade. There's a resonance of uh, of, of the, the, the force and the, the weight of these missionary movements upon the face and the voice, the singing voice of, of Brazilian Christianity. And uh, there are extra layers of American uh, cultural imperialism in Brazil in the 20th century. So my, my lens through which I kind of look at all of this is very much a lens of a, a Latin American kind of liberation, weird theologian, music person. Um, and that's what I do. When I when I started looking at Amazing Grace and how it pops in and out of hymnals in Brazil, it very much follows that same pattern where you don't hear much about it until uh, the second half of the 20th century it starts popping up. Um, and my analysis led me to three main hymnals from three denominations in Brazil that translate Amazing Grace. These are all very different texts. The, the, the titles don't match. Uh, the, the, the only thing that's similar is that they're all four stanzas long, but uh, it's very much uh, a, a text of uh, that varies. So lost and found in some of these Brazilian versions become uh, dark and light. There's a lot of light imagery which is not necessarily found in the original. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong heavenly presence, you know. Uh, that, that idea that Newton put there of within the veil, the veil reference uh, to the afterlife in the Brazilian version that is peppered throughout many different stanzas of many different versions. The wretched become the poor uh, in, in the Latin American versions. Uh, so so it, it really got me thinking about what this legacy means. And I went to some of, I watched dozens and dozens and dozens of performances of Amazing Grace by Brazilian artists, Brazilian church choir, Brazilian church musicians popular artists. And uh, I, 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 I arrived at this kind of uh, drift, this tension. And in that sense, I think that the legacy of hymns like Amazing Grace within these contexts um, are much like uh, those years of Newton's life when he was in between, when he was struggling with both his, uh, the beginning of what uh, he described as his conversion experience and his professional activity in the slave trade, those kind of liminal, confusing years. That that's the tension, I think, that describes um, a lot of this hymnody. When I look at the performance, I see a spectrum that ranges from downright imitation of either the English Anglican aesthetic uh, with all the accoutrements of your SAT choral organ experience to very uh, Brazilian renditions that kind of reconstruct Amazing Grace as some of them. Everything seems to fall out of where it should be from the, you know, it just offends every Anglican sensibility. But it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense if you can dance along. Um, so you have this range of, that goes between the imitation of an aesthetic or a set of aesthetics that have been handed to us as the proper way to sing this thing to what a Brazilian intellectual Oswaldo de Andrade in the 1920s and 30s would call anthropophagism, anthropophagy, where you, you literally will, will take whatever you give us. We'll take whatever areola who owned most of the Brazilian the music market uh, up to the middle of the 20th century, whatever, whatever jazz, whatever Glenn Miller, whatever, whatever they, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. But we're, we're absolutely going to transform it. And, and it's, it, it, it'll become a case of cultural virility. 
of, of, of religious area, of, 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 of a political state. We will make it ours. Uh, so the, 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 the resonances of, of Amazing Grace uh, confused me. And it's a legacy I wasn't sure what to do with. And I, I, I kind of moved from a place of translation. I work with a lot of performance studies and translation studies when I analyze these, these artifacts and how they flow along these lines of power, religion, business, and money, and capital. And I started with the idea of translation. It's like, okay, we have one English text. Okay, it gets translated. This is, you know, this is how that happens. Let's look at the text. But you start looking at the performances and the variety of translation. The well, amazing is a world that does not a word that does not exist in Portuguese. So it becomes incredible. It becomes precious. It becomes this other thing. Uh, and in the process, it's not a translation. Well, maybe it's a, a mosaic. Maybe it's a kaleidoscope. But that doesn't work either because all of you know these these metaphors they they presuppose this symmetry, this kind of uh, thought craft that goes into planning something that's visually stunning. So, okay, maybe it's not a mosaic. Maybe it's not a kaleidoscope of legacies. Maybe it's a fractal. But there's a problem there because fractals are also based on algorithms. The sense of organization that, go, that goes against the, the, the aesthetics of messiness that I tend to, you know, as a good Brazilian, I've changed this talk five times today. <laughs> um, but we improvise. It's, it's what we do. And finally, as I listened to our speakers, I came up with this image of a shattered mirror. It's a shattered mirror because it, it cracks and breaks along the fault lines of these relationships, of imperialist, colonialist uh, flows that go back and forth that have to do um, with, with Brazil's, Brazil's convoluted history within uh, within Latin America, its relation to the slave trade uh, as well. So maybe it's a legacy that's a, a shattered mirror that we can hold up to that history and that give us, gives us an opportunity to, to, uh, to reflect not only on that one hymn but, but how we stand ethically and aesthetically as, at these crossroads, which I think is a, is a great is a great image. You know, as a scholar, uh, there's this temptation, I think, of, of, of uh, pretending to travel. So this is what the data shows. Well, the, the data shows me uh, a shattered mirror that I'm a part of and that I have this very weird relationship with. Thank you.